Good morning. My name is Kelly Megan, and you are very welcome to this, the second part of a three-part series called A Taste of Excel. Today, we're looking at level two. So this is geared towards those who have used Excel a little bit um, and would like to kind of see what else Excel has to offer. And today we're going to be looking at the if function. This is an absolutely gorgeous function and it's the basis for so many other functions. So when we've had a look at that, we're going to mix it together with two functions that we dealt with yesterday morning. And yesterday we looked at the sum function and the average function. So we're going to be mixing the if with those. So we'll be looking at the sum if and the average if. Then we're going to be taking a look at working with different types of conditional formatting. And then we're going to look at a lovely feature called Flash Fill. So I'm going to bring you straight over to the sheet that we're going to be working on. So this is the data that we're going to be working with. And you can see that we have some people in our A column, and I'm pretending that they're salespeople working for us. So this is just data that has been typed in. In column B, we're pretending this is the sale amount that they've made today. And again, they're just values that have been typed in. So what we're going to be calculating is we want to calculate the commission that they're going to earn. Now, the structure of their commission is that if they have sold a thousand euros or more, then we're going to give them 6% of all that they've sold. But if they sold less than a thousand euros, we're going to give them 3% of all that they've sold. So the function that's going to do this for us is going to be the if function. This is a function that can make a decision based on the question that you ask it. So if you look over here on, on the right, you're going to see um, the three parts of the if function. So the if function is made up of a logical test. Now the logical test, another term you could use for that is a question. So you're going to ask a question or present a logical test. And if the result of that test is true, it'll carry out the value if true, whatever is in that box, and then it will just end. But if the logical test equates to false, then it will completely ignore the value of true. It'll jump down into the value of false and it'll carry out whatever action is in there instead. And then it'll end. So the question that we're going to ask or the logical test can never be both true and false. It can only ever be one or the other. So again, the question we're going to put to this is to see if it, the sales are a thousand or more. So my cursor is positioned onto C2. And if you remember from yesterday, my rule is you calculate the first one and you fill handle down. So we always set up our data so that we can do that. So we only calculate once and fill handle or copy the data down. So I'm ready to go. And now what I'm going to do is go up to the FX button. So I'm bringing in my function through the insert function button. And it's going to open up this dialog box. Now, a lot of people prefer to type their functions. And that's absolutely fine. There's no right way or wrong way. It's just I won't type unless I absolutely have to. I like Excel to do the work for me. So I'm going to come through this way. And when you click on that FX button, it's going to open up into this category called most recently used. Now, there's approximately 10 calculations or 10 functions that are going to be in here by default when you come into it for the first time. And if is always going to be in there if you're coming in for the first time by default. So I'm going to pick it there. But just be aware that once you start using this area, everything changes. So when you go into yours, it's not going to look the same as mine. But I'm going to show you how you can go out and you can find a function if it's not in here. So I've picked the if function and I'm going to click OK. And this is what functions look like when they're done through the FX button. So here are the three parts that you can see. The logical test, 
and you can see that's in bold so that tells you this is a required field there are no circumstances whatsoever that you can use any function without filling in a logical test the value of true and value of false are not bold so it does tell you there are times when you could get away with not using them but i've really very very rarely ever found that i don't use them so this box can be moved around. If you look up here at the top, this white bar, I can drag this box around the screen. And what I like to do with this is I like to use this box like, like a kind of a ruler. I, I place it on top of um, data that I'm going to be working on. And this is particularly good if you've got a really busy sheet. And it just makes sure that I don't click onto a cell that I don't mean to. So I want to make sure I do everything on B2, that I don't accidentally click too low and click on B3. And this prevents that. So now I'm ready. So everything takes place on this first person. So the logical test is to see if B2, the sales of a Kono, are greater than, and your greater than sign is your shift key and your full stop. The next part I want to put in is the equal sign to the left of the backspace. There must be no space between those uh, two keys. And I want to say B2 greater than or equal to 1000. Now, the right way really to do this is to have the value of 1000 typed into a cell so I can click on the cell and get Excel to read it. You might think I could use this cell because you can see 1000 there but I can't because I've got text in that cell with the figure. And if you put text into the same cell as a figure, it converts that figure to test text, so it can't be used. So I'm going to have to type this in manually. And to type it in manually, I don't use any formatting. So it's 1, 0, 0, 0. So no euro sign. It doesn't, care, doesn't matter that there's a euro sign there. You don't put formatting in here. I didn't even put in a comma. Now, you could, of course, put in decimal places if they were necessary, but they're completely unnecessary for what it is that I'm doing. So there's my logical test. I want to see if B2 is greater than or equal to, to, to 1,000. So remember, a logical test can be thought of as a question. I am questioning the data, and it's going to come back and tell me whether it's true or false. And you can see of course for this person we can see at a glance it's true so we know for this person they're going to get the calculation that i put into the value of true so now i'm going to put that calculation in so i'm going to click into the value of true and what i want to do if this equates to true is i would like b2 to be multiplied by so i put in my asterisk six percent now i do have six percent written out onto the screen so i can click on it and it's in cell g2 now this is where i've got to be clever with um, what i'm doing b2 here on the left in in these two boxes and it will be in the third one are relative in other words when i start copying that calculation down all the B2s will change to B3 so it can test what's on the next row. I do not want that to come off G2 and start moving on to G3, to G4, to G5, etc. So I need to lock it in place. And the way you lock it in place is once you've clicked on the cell, you press the F4 key once at the top of the screen. And that places two dollar signs into the calculation so it places a dollar sign to the left of the column reference which is the letter g and a dollar sign to the left of the row reference which is the number two and that's called absolute so that's now fixed in place and now i have to say what i want to have happen if it's not true because although we know okona is going to get the six percent other people are going to get the three percent so if it's false, then B2, the sales of the first person, should be multiplied by 3%. And again, I have 3% there, so I'm going to click onto it. And when I click onto it, I need to lock it in place. So I'm pressing F4 at the top of the keyboard once. So when we look at this calculation, 
here on the left hand side all the b2s are relative and what that means is that when we fill handle down and again i just use fill handle into the next one as an example when we fill handle to c3 all the b2s will change to b3 because it will carry out the calculation relative to the row the right hand side on the other hand is absolute these two because we made them absolute using the f4 key and this is what we call an absolute value because I physically typed it in so it can't change. So that's it. I'm happy that my calculation is correct. I click OK and there is a Kono's value of 90. I'm going to fill handle down. Now this time I'm going to show you a quick way to fill handle. So the fill handle is when you place your cursor on that little node and you get that black crosshair. Now yesterday I showed you click and drag and click and drag is fine when you're working with small data but if I had 20,000 odd cells once I get the fill handle I would double click and I promise you it's not it doesn't look anything on a small sheet like this but if you had 20,000 calculations that would be then done in a split instance by a double click and I promise you that's one of the most impressive features in Excel when you're working with large data. Okay now to make this data look a little bit nicer I'm going to put currency on so I'm coming up to the number group and I'm going to click the currency button and that's going to place the accounting style currency onto our figures and put them automatically to two decimal places and because there are decimals in there I would leave them at two decimal places. Now, when you carry out a calculation like this for the first time, there is nothing wrong with getting out a calculator and checking your figures. And I really would advise you to, to be comfortable to do that. Yet you have to know and be confident that you're doing it right and that Excel is doing it right. And if that means checking with a calculator, just go for it. But I want to show you how you can get back in to check it yourself on the sheet. So if we look on the next row down, we can see that James's sales did not get up to the, the thousand euro mark. So we know James should go down the false path. So what we do is we click onto James's calculation and we go up into the FX button. And when we do that, it opens the calculation for row three, James's row. And we can see, yes, James went down the false path. So didn't get the higher calculation, got the lower calculation. And I'm just going to cancel out of that. Whereas Louisa, we can see, will have gone down the high, higher path or the true path. So when I click onto that FX, I know I'm going to see true. And she got the calculation from true here. And again, I'll cancel it. And we'll take a look at one more. And I can see that um, Jennifer down here has definitely not made the mark so I'm going to click on the FX and we can see yep yeah, Jennifer went down the false path and got the lower of the two calculations so it's very easy to get back into a calculation to look at it or of course you might want to get in to make a change to it but that's our if function isn't it absolutely gorgeous the function that can make a decision now the if function can be paired with the sum function and the average function. So we're going to take a look at that. But we would use it under slightly different conditions. So generally we'd use that where we have repeat information. So for instance, repeat names in the one column. So I'm going to set the data up so that you can see exactly what I mean. I'm going to highlight this data here and control C to copy. And I'm going to click down here and control V to paste. And I'm just going to scroll down, click into the cell under it again and control V again. So I've actually pasted that um, twice. So the information is in there three times. And I'll just press escape to get rid of that marking around that selection. 
So I've got the data in there now three times. And that means if I was to look into that data and add up the sales for Okono, it's going to come to 4,500. OK, but that's exactly what we would use the sum if for. We look in to it where there is repeat data and ask it to find somebody's name and then sum the sales from a different column but the same row so that it's going to find the sales here. It's going to find a Kono sales here again and it's going to find it further down. Great stuff. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to lay the data out on the screen, lay the names out so that you can see how this works. So I'm going to highlight these first few people here and I'm going to just right click copy or of course control C. I'm going to place my cursor here and right click. Now this time I'm not using the bog standard paste. What I'm going to do is I'm going to paste the names across the row. So I'm using the fourth paste called transpose. And that takes a column of data and transposes it to a row. So I'll click onto that. And now I'm going to highlight the rest of this data. So just in uh, the first uh, amount of data. And again, I will copy that. I'll come down a few rows. I right click and do exactly the same thing. I'm going to paste transpose. Perfect. Now, I'd like to be able to see those names and make it a little bit clearer for you. So I'm going to bring my cursor up into the column heading of E, click, hold down the click and drag across the columns. And then I'm going to place my, car my cursor here uh, between two columns and double click to auto widen them. Now, they've gone off the screen a little bit, so I'm going to hide this column here, here column C. So I'll right click up here and I'm going to hide. And I'm also going to just drag in column D there a little bit so that we can see all the names clearly on the screen. I'll click here where I'm going to deal with my calculation. And again, I'm going to press escape just to get rid of the mark of the copy from the screen. So this time I'm going to be calculating um, looking this way and fill handling looking this way. And it's a sum if I want to do. So I'm going to pick up my sum if function. So I, I've got my cursor where I want the answer. I'm going up to my FX and I'm going to pretend that the sum if function is not here. And I'm going to show you how to hunt down a function. So what you do is you go to the right of the most recently used category, click the down arrow. And I don't bother with all those different categories. I just go straight to the all category because every single function in Excel and, and there's over all, there's over 550 in, in the newest versions, but every single one of them is listed here alphabetically. Now, once I've changed over to all, I then click down into this lower part of the window. Now, the reason I click down there is to activate that part of the window so that when I type, it'll take the type in this part of the window. So I'm going to type the first three letters, S-U-M, and I type it very quickly. If you type too slowly, it'll see them as individual letters. You have to make it um, type quickly to make it think it's a single word. Now I only have a tiny bit of scrolling to do to pick up the sum if, and once I've selected it and clicked OK, it will automatically be contained in my most recently used category. So I don't have to hunt it down a second time. OK, so let's take a look at what we have to carry out within the sum if. We have two required fields, the range and the criteria, and then we have the sum range. The range it tells you here is the range of cells that we want to evaluate. Now, I know that's not the always the easiest thing to read, but the easy way to remember it is just to know what your criteria is. The criteria that you're looking up is a Kono Conte. So the range has to be the set of cells that the words a Kono Conte are contained in. So that's going to be our A column. So to do the range, I'm going to click on to cell A2. So I'm going to be very specific about the range. Now, because this goes beyond the length of my screen, I'm going to click and drag. I would treat this like I would a large sheet. So once I've clicked on the first cell, 
I hold down control and shift together and press the down arrow. And that will select the entire column of data as long as there are no blank cells in the way. Again, this is why we don't like blanks in our data. Now that I've done that, I need to lock that column down so that when I fill handle, it doesn't move off the A column onto the B column. And of course, the way I lock it down is I press F4. But the F4 key has an unexpected extra uh, little happening for us, and that is that it scrolls us off the screen. Thank you, Excel. That is very kind of you. So now that I've got that first part done, I'm going to click down into the criteria box and the criteria is going to be a Kono Conte. So I'm going to click onto that and let Excel read it. And you can see Excel is able to read that no problem. Now I'm going to leave that relative so that when I fill handle across this way, it'll change from E5 to F5 and it'll change reading from a Kono Conte to James Reed and then on to Louisa, etc. Perfect. Now I'm going to put in the sum range. Now the sum range is obviously going to be sales, but it has to match our range by row. So I started this one on row two and went to row 46. So this must be row two to row 46 to match it. So I'm going to click on to B2, control shift down arrow to select and F4 will lock it in place, but it will also very kindly scroll me up the screen. That's it. I click OK. And there is that amount, 4,500. And again, we know that's correct because I have that value in there three times for a Kono. Now I'm going to put on the currency and that tidies it up and it puts it on before I fill handle so that when I grab my fill handle and drag it across, and unfortunately we do have to drag when we go across, there's no quick way, um, it's going to copy the formatting with that as well. Now I keep mentioning that when we do um, a fill handle, it's actually only a copy and paste. So I just want to show you that. I've got this all selected. I want to repeat it for this data here for these people. So I'm going to right click into that data and copy. But I make sure I'm picking one cell to paste into. So it's right click and it's the bog standard paste. I click onto that and I just need to extend it. So I grab the fill handle and I'll extend it for David. And now everybody here has been done. So again, if I look on this cell and look up into the formula bar, you can see that this has changed to E9. It is looking at it relatively. So remember from yesterday, the power of Excel is not the ability to do one calculation. It is the ability to copy those calculations. So I'm going to do uh, very quickly do one more, and that's the average if. So I place my cursor here. I'll go up to the FX. I'm in the all category, so I'll, I'll chase it down from here. I'll just click down here, type in the first three letters, AVE, scroll down until I see average if, and click OK. And you'll be delighted to know structurally this is identical to the sum if. So everything that we put into this is the same as what we put into the sum if, but this, of course, is going to do a different calculation. It's going to get the average. So the range is A2, control shift down arrow to A46 and make it absolute. The criteria is a Kono Conte. I leave it relative. The average range, the range we want the average of, B2, control shift down arrow to B46. I'm going to make it absolute. So structurally identical, I'm going to click OK. And again, we know that's correct. That's that original value there. I'm going to put on our um, currency format so that I can copy that across when I fill handle. And again, if I right click, copy, right click, paste, you can see it does the calculation. And I just need to extend that for David over there. And that is our if function, our sum if 
and our average if. And I think you have to agree the if function is just such a lovely function and so are its siblings. Okay, so now what we're going to do, we're going to move on and we're going to look at conditional formatting. So I am going to open up or unhide this column that I've hidden. So I hid column C to get it open. I'm going to go up onto B and drag across to D and then right click and unhide. Now that I have that open, I want to insert two columns to the left of C. So I highlight C and D and I'm going to right click and insert and that will insert two columns for me. And now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to highlight this data and I'm going to take a copy of this data and place it into here. And the copy, I'm just going to do it again by going control C, click in here, control V, and I've copied my data and escape, I'm going to escape to get rid of that line around that data. Now, I'm copying this out because this is what I would often do when I'm going to do conditional formatting. It depends on the type of conditional formatting, but it'll make sense in a moment when I show it to you. So I've highlighted this data, which is exactly the same as this data here. And I'm going to pop up to conditional formatting, which is in the styles group of the home tab. And I'm going to click onto that. Now I'm going to just bypass the top two for the moment, and I'm going to come into date bars. And I'll just roll over these and you'll see that what it does is it looks at the information that's contained in the cells and it creates the data bars um, to match the information. Now, I'm going to just click on to this one and it's placed it in. And the reason I always do this uh, type of thing on a copy is I actually don't like the figures being in the cells with the data bars. So I keep them highlighted. And I go back up to conditional formatting, and then I come down to manage rules at the bottom. So I'm going to click on to manage rules, and then I'm going to select my rule, and I'm going to edit it. And there's all kinds of different things that you can do in here, but I'm only interested in turning off the figures themselves. So you need them there to create the data bars, but I just want to see the bars only. I'm going to click OK, click OK again, and that's why I like to do some of this work on, on a copy, because I think that looks, it looks quite nice having your kind of in-cell charts there. Now to take that back off again, I just highlight it. I haven't lost it. It, it, it is all sitting, all my figures are sitting there in the background. I just come back up to the button, I clear the rules, and either of these selections would work because I don't have any other rules on the sheet, but I just make it a habit to clear from my selected cells and that gives me my data back. Now, the next one down in that is the color scales. Now, the way the color scales work, if you can see that uh, tooltip there, it says green, yellow, red. So whatever color is mentioned first, green, it means the darker the green, the higher the value. Whatever color is mentioned last, the darker the red, the lower the value. And then it has it turned uh, around. So it's a, it's a kind of a heat map um, style thing. I don't use it very often. I, I found it can be quite confusing for people. Um, and I think when you use something like this, it's a good idea to place it, uh, to write something out onto the screen explaining what it means. But I think you can see quite clearly how it works. So I'm going to bring you down onto the next one because this is used an awful lot. So you can see here I've got directional arrows, um, I've got different colors, different shadings, I've got shapes. A really popular one is the this whole traffic light, whether they're rimmed or not. I've got indicators and I've got different styles of ratings and I have a live preview of them all. So what I'm going to go for is just the very, very first uh, bog standard three arrows. And I'm going to click onto that. Now, I'm not in the slightest bit worried about the hash signs. Remember, if I want the values there, I would just widen the column to show them. But of course, I'm going to get rid of them. But what I want to show you as well is that if I go into conditional formatting and I go into manage rules, 
and I select this and go edit rule, I can do exactly what I did before, which is to show the icon only. Now that's fine. We know how to do that. What interests me with this is that when you look down here, this shows you what Excel bases its values on. And of course, it's looking at the figures and it's deciding that if it's greater than or equal to 67%, that's when you should put the green icon on and greater than or equal to 33%, but less than 67 is amber and anything below 33 should be red. And that's actually not what I want. So I'm going to change it to match the kind of work that I've been doing. But before you change this part, you need to make sure whether you want to change this or not. And I do. I don't want it to be percent. I want to base it on the figures. So I'm going into the down arrow and I'm choosing number. And you need to do this part first because it wipes out anything that's written in here. So I'm changing both of those to number. And I want this to be green if it's greater than or equal to 1000, just like what we were doing um, earlier. And I think I'd like it to be amber if it's greater than or equal to 900. So I'm being very harsh. And I'm going to say anything less than 900 is going to get a red arrow. So I'm going to click OK, click OK again. Those figures get removed. And now the green arrows are reflecting um, exactly what I did earlier here, that they are greater than or equal to um, 1,000. So very, very simple to apply. And again, I'm going to highlight that, click onto conditional formatting. I'm going to choose Manage Rules. I'll highlight my rule. And I can... Oh, apologies. I'm actually going to get rid of that. My apologies. I'm going to clear it. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to the top area and I'm going to do highlight cells rule. Now you can see the different choices that you've got in here, but I'm going to, the nearest thing that I've got to what I was doing on the sheet is greater than. So I'm going to go into that. And again, you can see that this is all pre-set up by Excel. And wherever possible, I go with the presets because it saves me so much work. Now, it does say greater than, which I'm not really happy with, but I'll show you how to fix that. So I just type over this. This is already highlighted. So I'm going to go 1000. And then over here on the right, um, I wouldn't want that to be red because I'm saying this is this is good. So I'm going to take the green fill with dark green text, but of course I could customize if I wanted to, I just couldn't be bothered. So I'm going to choose green fill with dark green text and I'm going to click OK. Now I'm looking at, at these figures and I'm going, ah, oh, but that leaves Casper out and Casper came in bang on the nose of 1000. So off I go again, conditional formatting, and I'm going to manage the rules. So I click onto that, select my rule and edit it. And this is where I can change the greater than and I can go to the down arrow and say greater than or equal to. And again, you could see I could change the format here if I wanted to, but I'm happy with that. So I'm going to click OK and I'm going to click OK again. And now Caspin did it. Back up. And I'm going to clear the rules from the selected cells. Keeping those cells selected, this time what I'm going to do is go into top and bottom rules. And I'm going to show you how you can put on two rules at a time. And actually, you can put on up to 64 different sets of rules on the same data. I've never, I don't know anyone who's ever done that, and I don't know why you'd want to, but you can. So I'm going to show you how to put on two sets of rules. You just have to make sure they don't cross over each other. So I'm interested in seeing my top 20%. So I choose top 10%. It opens up and you can see that I can increase this using the little up arrows. Or once it's selected, I can just type over it. And it's uh, top 20 that I want, but I don't want it to be red. 
of course I want it to be green fill with dark green text and I'm going to click OK. Now that's my top 10. I'm going to go into conditional formatting. I'm going back into top bottom rules and I'm going to also set my bottom 10%. So I'm going to click onto that and again I'm going to highlight and I'm going to type in 20. Now this time I'm going to leave that with a red fill and I'm going to click OK and now you can see both the top, ten, top 20 sorry, and the bottom 20 together. So that's our conditional formatting. And the next thing that I'm going to show you, and the last thing that I'm going to show you is flash fill. So I'm going to move to the next sheet to show you that. Now this feature is an absolutely lovely feature. It's not connected as such to what we've been doing, but I just love it. So I wanted to, to share it with you. This is often the way that we receive data um, in Excel. We'll receive, for instance, the name in the uh, all together, in both the first name and the surname. And that'll often happen. People will send you the data like that, or it might come down from SAP or something like that in that way. And ideally, you should have first names in one column and surnames in another column. So I'm going to show you how we can use the flash fill feature to achieve this. So the first thing, it's important um, to, I'm going to uh, type this out, so it's important to spell this correctly, but Excel loves a pattern to follow, so that's what I'm trying to get here. So I'm going to type in O-K-O-N-O -O -O for Okono, and I'm only typing in the first name. I press the Enter key on the keyboard, and now for the second one, I'm going to type the J for James, but it doesn't matter if I capitalize it or not. All I press is the J and there's Excel and it says, oh, is this what you're trying to do? And of course it is. So for me to accept this, I just press enter again. Isn't that just super? So now if I want to do the surname, same thing. And it's just be conscious of your spelling and also capitalization. Because if I don't capitalize on the first one, then it'll copy the non-capitalization down the rest of them. So I've got that looking exactly the way I want it, and I'm going to press enter. So now I can press R and enter again to accept it. So that is our flash fill. And as I say, Excel loves a pattern. Now, equally, I can do it the other way around. If I need to join them together, but suppose I wanted to join this together um, and I want it to be Conte, comma, uh, space Okono. So I want surname first. All I do is give Excel the pattern. So Conte, comma, space. And again, I'm being very careful to get the spelling right because it has to be able to copy that. And I'm going to press enter. And now if I put in R, there it is. And I'll press enter and I'll widen that column. And that's the flash fill feature. OK, well, I hope you've enjoyed our session today. Um, and don't forget that we do have a session on pivot tables uh, tomorrow. And that's going to be very much uh, geared towards, again, people who wouldn't have a great knowledge of Excel. So it's going to be pivot tables and it's going to be data structure. So I'm going to hand over to Sorka for the Q&A. Thank you.